Yes, 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 sir. Yes. Oh, is already in here. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Okay, then uh, hello. Uh, yeah, let us, yes, hello. Let us start our international webinar on the topic mathematical application in uh, human cognition and neuroscience. And it is now 3 p.m. as per Indian Standard Time. And so I, on behalf of the mathematics department at Assam Don Bosco University, India, wish good afternoon to all and extend our heartiest and warm welcome to Professor Robin I. M. Dunbar, our speaker, and Dr. Santono Asarji, second speaker, and all the participants all over the world to this international webinar on the topic mathematical application in human cognition and neuroscience. I am very happy to announce that this webinar is a big event in the sense that more than 3,200 participants have registered for this webinar from 51 different countries all over the world. And with the Assam Don Bosco University community, it's very pleased and welcome all of you to this webinar. Before embarking upon main agenda, let us pray to Almighty God for a few seconds for the success of the webinar. And uh, let me go now to my prayer. This is lighting a candle for peace, love, and progress. And this is the prayer to Almighty God. discussions today in this webinar, basically on the, sorry, basically on the social brain, 
And this social brain in this field is composed of a lot of different concepts and idea, and that is the, some genetic emotions, experimental neuroimaging, biology, religions, evolutions, social and primate behavior, brain, neuroscience, cognitive, and so many different concepts are deeply involved to the study of the social brain. And our main discussion of the social brain with different components, and we think that it is a very fast and excellent, very challenging research area, very interdisciplinary research area for all sections of the speakers. And now let us come to my uh, other things now. Well, um, I hope our honorable Vice Chancellor, Reverend Dr. Father, Dr. Stephen Marple, and he will, in his welcome address, will highlight academic scenario of Assam Don Bosco University. And very briefly, Assam Don Bosco University is a top university and is an international sweet home for higher education, for different degrees, research work, community work, etc. Every year, several thousand students from different parts of India and abroad have been successfully prosecuting their higher study in this university as because Don Bosco University is engaged in a scientific reflection on the Salesian educative system both in theory and practice, and is boosting international linkages and collaboration in university education. Our mathematics department of Assam Don Bosco University is also very strong in teaching, research, and extension work. We are very happy today to announce that to internationally reputed academicians, Professor Robin I. M. Dunbar, Emeritus Professor of Evolutionary Psychology, University of Oxford, UK, and Dr. Santonu Asarji from Gohati University, India, have kindly agreed to deliver the webinar talks. And we are really very grateful to these two speakers. And the topic of the first speaker is fractal pattern in the structure of human and primate social groups. And the topic of the second speaker, Dunbar graphs and their future prospect. And just to have a simple glimpse on the topic of the webinar, I would like to say that Mathematics has tremendous application in human psychology, human cognition, and neuroscience. Mathematical psychology is an approach to psychological research that is based on mathematical modeling of perceptual thought, cognitive and motor processes, and on the establishment of like rules that real relate quantifiable stimulus characteristic with quantifiable behavior. Mathematics development has resulted in substantial advances in our understanding of the evolution of the human brain and a cognitive system that support our sense of discrete quantity and magnitude more generally as well as how this system are expressed and say during development. Much of the neuroimaging research has focused on how mathematical operations are performed. While many branches of neuroscience use a lot of mathematics, neuroengineers are active in the field in a variety of very mathematics intensive ways 
including neural interface design, neural simulation, multiphasic simulations, and all this area is entirely dependent upon mathematics and physics. Just to say, the main objective of today's webinar, webinar in order to justify how mathematics stand as a highly interdisciplinary subject, to arouse the spirit and enthusiasm of multidisciplinary research in the mind of our student and research worker, to create an international platform to pursue collaborative research in the field of evolutionary neuroscience, mathematical psychology, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, cognitive science, etc., through global understanding and harmony. We have organized this international webinar to deliver by two eminent mathematicians. And now, I'd like, it is my great pleasure to request our respectable Vice Chancellor, Reverend Father Dr. Stephen Maple, to present his welcome address. Father. Our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Father Dr. Stephen, is requested to give his welcome address, please. Thank you, Professor Datta. Yes. That was a wonderful introduction to the webinar. Let me wish good morning, good afternoon, good evening to participants from all around the world. It's my privilege to welcome the very large number of participants, as has been already said, to this international webinar on mathematical applications in human cognition and neuroscience. It's a large number by any reckoning. Though we are not able to see one another, let me assure you that we feel encouraged and honored to see such enthusiasm for this seminar. I wish we could have had it here in this lovely campus of ours in the northeastern corner of India that we call home. Assam, the state of Assam, where we are situated, and the six other states contiguous to us, which are an anthropologist's paradise. Let me start right at the beginning by placing on record our deep appreciation to Professor Robin Dunbar, Professor of Evolutionary Psychology from the University of Oxford, for graciously accepting to be the keynote speaker at this webinar. I should have actually said that Professor Dunbar deserves our appreciation for conspiring with Professor Tarini Kumar Datta from our university to give shape to this idea and the webinar. Together with the head of the Department of Mathematics, Dr. Hemant Barali, and our second speaker this afternoon, Dr. Sandanu Acharji from Gahati University. As each of the speakers will be introduced elaborately before their presentations. Let me limit myself to welcoming you in our traditional Indian style with a namaste. When this pandemic will be behind us, you are welcome, Professor Danbar, to our university. We will be happy to host you and we'll be delighted to have you interact with our faculty and students. We do look forward to the presentations from both of you. Let me now, in a minute or two, say a few words about our university, Assam Don Bosco University. Established, as a, established in 2008 as the first state university of Assam in the private sector. Our university is the shared dream of a cross-section of individuals, organizations, and agencies, prime among them being the sponsors of the university, Don Bosco Society. Our work as Don Bosco Society spans 132 countries, currently educating 9 million young men and women through an elaborate network of schools, technical and agricultural centers, colleges and universities, and impacting the lives of hundreds of thousands more 
true sandwich covering the entire spectrum of social development. If I may put into a few words, our aim in establishing this university, it would be roughly these three. To promote, to create and promote a milieu where dependable human beings are formed. To provide the right, right mix of courses and skills to ensure the employability of our graduates. To awaken in our graduates the will and the desire to bring about social change wherever they find themselves. Prior to launching this project, we conceptualized what we wanted this university to be. And let me briefly share with you that vision that with which we started this university. We want this university to be a center for culture, knowledge, research, intellectual ferment, for critical thinking and analysis of whatever shapes and impacts human life that influences thinking, planning, policy making, on all the vital aspects of social life, such as culture, religion, society, politics, governance, education, health care, and many such, many such areas of concern in a society. This will be a center, it's already a center, also for getting, getting a much thought after degree to ensure security in life for our graduates. Every course being offered, being job oriented or employment generating. But even in this, the emphasis for us as John Bosco University is not mere technical competence, but self-reliance, wisdom, and social responsibility. Slowly, but steadily, we are getting there. With about 4,000 students on campus and another 5,000 or so from 111 countries taking our online courses through DBU Global. We are indeed a small university, but we do nurse big dreams as you have just heard. I'm convinced that when this pandemic is behind us, the new normal, as they have started calling it, will be shaped by changed perceptions about self and the other. There has already started a new and urgent search for meaning by all sections of society in every part of the world. It is in keeping with this seismic shock that we are reeling from and the realization that life as usual will not be the new normal in the future, we have framed the theme for our academic year that we have just commenced, and it reads, searching for meaning in the bits and pieces of life. In that search, our original vision as a university and as Don Bosco Society will be our source of inspiration. As I conclude, let me thank again our speakers, Professor Dunbar and Dr. Acharji, and the organizers, especially the coordinator, Professor Sarini Kumar Datta, and the Department of Mathematics, headed by Dr. Hemant Barely. Let me end these words of welcome once again with our namaste, and a few views of our main campus here at the university. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I have, a, I have then, a small presentation. Okay, all right. Okay. From here, no? Good show. Good show. It does not pick up. Huh? You are saying, oh. It did not come, no? Mm -hmm. Uh, press and share. No, it is not coming through. It's okay, Professor Data, it is not coming through. Okay, if possible, you are requested to show at the end of the lecture also. Right. And you try no, that again. Will be, will be okay. fine. In any case, thank you very much, uh, Father, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, for your very enlightening welcome address to the all participants all over the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And my sin next sincere request to Dr. Monmuri Borua, our Honorable Director, School of Fundamental and Applied Science, 
to tell something about the academic achievements of Professor Dan Dr. Borwa. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I feel privileged to introduce Professor Ian McDonald Dunbar, Emeritus Professor of Evolutionary Psychology, Fellow Magdalen College, Oxford University, Research Associate, Nuffield College, Oxford University, Co-Director, British Academy, Centenary Research Project, Fellow, Royal Anthropological Institute, Fellow, British Academy, Fellow, Association of Psychological Science, Fellow, Galton Institute. He was working with different posts at different academic institutions, universities. He has been closely associated with different national and international academic committees. He has received many outstanding awards, honors, more than 17 in numbers. He has delivered more than 200 invited Plenary, plenary lectures at different universities all over the globe. He has supervised research students more than 45. He has published 20 authored or edited books, 310 research articles in scientific journals, seven technical reports, over some hundred pieces of science journalism, and 130 book reviews. Professor Dunbar's latest published paper in the Proceeding of Royal Society, London Mathematics, and BBC has covered this paper in their news on 20th August 2020. Why lockdown may have lasting effect on our friendship. Professor Dunbar, Dunbar has discovered a number 150, known as the Dunbar number, show his intensive research work by finding a correlation between primate brain size and average social group size of brain. Dunbar's number is a suggestive cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationship. Relationship in which individual, in which an individual knows who each person is and how each person relates to every other person. Dunbar's number has tremendous application to the scientific and social networking system. In particular, this number has become interest in anthropology, evolutionary psychology, statistics, mathematics, physics, business management, and so on. Welcome, sir, for to this webinar, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I'm sure all of us will be enriched from your talk. The platform is yours now, sir. Thank you, Dr. Borua, for your nice introduction to Professor Danbar. Danbar. Hello, Professor Danbar. You are most welcome. And you are requested to present your talk. And the topic of his talk is Fractal Patterns in the Structure of Human and Primate Social Groups. Professor Danbar. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the warm welcomes. And um, uh, one of these days, I, I indeed hope to, to, to be able to visit you in, uh, in your university there. Thank um, you. I, 
Um, I hope the internet is, is not going to disappoint us. The miracles of modern technology too often let us down. But uh, I, I, I'm sure we have a, a plan in place uh, if, if the um, uh, thing freezes on us. But uh, just uh, to get on with the talk while we still have, have connection here, um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, mainly really about some of the, the, the more mathematical aspects of, of um, uh, uh, the work uh, we've been doing over the years on, on the size and structure of uh, human social groups in particular. Um, I, um, uh, I'm not a mathematician. Um, I rely on uh, many uh, physicists and, and mathematicians uh, to do all the heavy mathematical work for me, uh, but still um, uh, I, I hope I don't mispresent uh, some, some of their findings. I'm going to now s switch into my presentation, um, uh, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, will allow you all to see um, uh, my graphs and so on. Um, uh, but uh, if for any reason the system doesn't uh, show what we want to see. There we go. Um, uh, Professor Dutta, can you just confirm that you can see the screen OK with the slides? Because I can't see the screen. Is, is that showing OK? Uh, slide, is, slide is not appearing at this moment. OK, it's, it does. Most of these systems take quite a while to bring the slides up, I think. Uh, let's go back and see what I can see. Uh, does that come up yet? Uh, not. Uh, you please press in now the entire screen. Present now, you push the button, present now, and then entire yes. screen. Yes, no, it, it's uh, that's And what, then uh, you, you push at the middle of some camera type picture, and then share. Which this should be showing, but just a minute. Try this. Ah, there we go. What we want is that one at the back. Is that coming through now? Uh, we are here. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Now, yes. You know, yes. yes. Okay. okay. Now, yes. Your slide is coming. Okay. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Modern technology is very imperfect, I'm afraid. Okay, so I'm going to talk mainly about the fractal structures of, of um, human and, and just to put it in its broader context, primate social groups. So I'm, I'm not going to talk much about the um, neuroscience behind this or, or so much the behavior behind this, but just try and sort of understand from, from a, a structural point of view how this works. So the starting point for this story really is is this graph which plots the size of uh, average size of groups in different primate species against uh, a measure of um, their brain size the particular measure doesn't matter too much uh, it's just essentially a measure of how cognitively competent they are that if you like in simple terms they're intelligent and this produces this set of four um, grades um, indicated by the, the dotted lines there, which uh, reflect increasing levels of social complexity as you go from the left side of the graph to the right side. Now, this is what's known as the social brain hypothesis, the explanation for why primates have unusually big brains compared to all other species. Uh, and the argument is that they live in very complex bonded societies that say they have friendships in the way we would think of friendships in humans and maintaining friendships is very costly both in time and in uh, brain power and it's, this is the reason why 
we see this pattern in primates. We only see this pattern in primates. We don't really see it in, in any other species of birds and mammals. So the question for us today is, well, where do humans fit in on this line? We want to uh, 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 see, look at this particular line here, which is the line for apes. Uh, these are chimpanzees up here, orangutans and gorillas here, and the gibbons, with which uh, in Assam you'll be very familiar uh, as, a, as a group set down here, all the gibbons, many gibbon species. So we want to know where on this line really humans sit. We know what their brain size is or their neocortex ratio we're using here uh, from the same database from which uh, all these other primate data come. And so it's just a matter of plugging up uh, the relative uh, neocortex size for uh, 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 humans, uh, seeing where it crosses the ape line and then reading off across here. And remember these these axes are in log scale. So this is the equivalent really of about 150 individuals. And that's the number that's now known as Dunbar's number. So the question is, do uh, humans really live in such small groups? Because after all, uh, we can live in huge cities, Mumbai, uh, whatever, uh, 10 million or so people these days that, that, that live there. Many of the big cities are obviously huge. But what's the real size of our natural human social group? So this is one way we've looked at this. These are data from uh, a uh, mobile phone uh, provider for one very large European country. So it's about 6 million subscribers, um, uh, uh, about 20% of the entire population. Um, and you can see there's a distribution, there's an, uh, pretty much a, uh, uh, well, it's a, in, on a log scale, it's a normal distribution. Obviously, it has a long tail to the right uh, in, in raw data. But essentially, the average here, you have this very strong peak in average at about 150, 150 people contact. So the, the, all the yellow uh, uh, dots here are the individual, all 6 million data points, the, the dashed lines of the uh, normal curve fitted to these data. So that's, that's the kind of data we look at to kind of establish that this number um, has reality. Uh, the, these mobile phone data sit very nicely with an, with an average of about 150 contacts. So putting together a whole set of different estimates from, from different sources, um, uh, 11 of these estimates are personal social network size, so the telephone database, for example, uh, uh, email contacts, uh, uh, networks, um, Facebook uh, uh, data, and 11 of them are estimates of natural community sizes. A lot of these are uh, community sizes in hunter-gatherers, which is the context in which we have spent most of our evolutionary history of a species, so we take that as being the most typical. Again, if you if you put all these data together, what you get is a um, quite a nice uh, normal distribution, as you might expect, with um, uh, a mean uh, uh, social group size um, somewhere around about 130 to 150. It's in about the ballpark area where uh, the primate graph predicts we should lie. So we take that as the sort of uh, basis, really, of our social world. Um, uh, if we look at that collection of individuals that we include in this social network of ours, personal social network, and I should say this includes both family and friends, extended family uh, and friends. Um, if we look at the patterns of interaction among uh, the members of the group and how we interact with them. Uh, the picture is not one uh, that looks like the picture on the left there, where you just have uh, a mass of people all interacting with, with everybody else. Or in this case, since this is a, a big concert somewhere, um, probably on, only paying attention in this case to, to the band on the stage. Our social networks look much more like in their structure, much more like the picture here on the bottom uh, right, uh, very clumpy and, and with sort of subgroupings, highly structured as it were. 
So this uh, has le led us to look, try and un un unpick this a bit, bit more. Here are the same uh, mobile phone data where we've tried to look at the distribution patterns or around that um, uh, what looks like a single uh, um, uh, distribution, if you like, mathematical distribution, uh, sort of normal distribution, try and pull it apart. Um, uh, our, our problem in the first instance is to decide whether this is, is uh, a single uh, population with a, a simple um, uniform uh, normal type distribution with a single mode or whether in fact consists of several different modes. So, um, whoops, uh, uh, jumping ahead of myself here. Um, what, what we've uh, essentially tried to do is, is to uh, fit many different kinds of distributions to, to these data uh, and see how well they um, describe it. And by far the best fit by a long, long way is a, um, uh, a set of four uh, Poisson distributions. Uh, and, and here they are, uh, you can see them fairly clearly. The, the analyses of the, of the clustering patterns suggest that ideally there are uh, either four or five, this is what's shown down here, clusters are, are, are the optimal way to, to break um, the data up. Um, so we, t we um, um, take this, in this particular case, with, with these data as, as having four as the ideal uh, way of splitting them up. Um, it actually turns out if we uh, uh, look, do the same kind of analysis on Facebook um, uh, postings, so these are, these are named postings where people are, uh, are referencing each other and intending to talk to a specific person, or on, on Twitter data sets, this is a, a very large Twitter data set scraped from Twitter where we're looking at the conversations between the followers of the Twitter account, not the number of followers of, of the Twitter account, but the actual conversations going on between the people who are the followers. And uh, I've done the same kind of analysis, and you can see the patterns um, here um, uh, divided in, in, into their layers. Facebook and Twitter is an early fa public Facebook data set. You'd never get these data now from Facebook, but in about 2009, they released a data set, which is what everybody uses. So it's a very early data set. People weren't using it as extensively as they are now. So these sort of 150 layer is missing at the moment uh, from both these uh, data sets. We can see here's the phone data set. Here's um, uh, uh, our face-to-face -face data set, essentially. And you can see these clusterings of these layers. So you have uh, a very, very small number of very close people and then layers increase beyond that. Um, if we do the same kinds of analyses uh, for social groupings as opposed to personal social networks, so these are, if you like, organizational data, the structure of um, uh, small-scale societies, uh, which is what these two data sets here are. Um, uh, these are another one, another of our personal social network data sets, which we've done looking at who's, who people sent Christmas cards to. Uh, these analyses here are done uh, as uh, uh, spectral analyses. So what they're trying to do is to look for the fractal pattern in the data. The fractal pattern in the data is identified as these peaks here. And if you translate the position of those peaks into what it means in real life, what it's telling you is that there's a recurring pattern uh, with a scaling ratio of about three. So in other words, it has a series of layers. Each layer is three times the size of the layer inside it. I'll show you what that means in a minute. But here's another analysis by another group um, of hunter-gatherer groupings. Um, they've used a, a Horton order analysis, which essentially does the same thing. It's looking for fractal patterns, but it does it uh, in a very different way. Um, these analyses here make no assumptions about the existence of groups. They simply ask the data to tell us. The, these Horton order analyses assume that we know what these groupings are and just look at the size distributions. And the scaling ratio is given by the correlation here or the regression line here 
between the size of these groupings, or you could do it the other way around, the frequency, and the layering order, the Horton order um, uh, here. And, and the, the slope on that line is, again, almost exactly three. So these three analyses all agree that there's a fractal pattern in the data with a scaling ratio of about three. Just to show you the data from hunter-gatherers, uh, here they are. They live in camping groups, camp groups, or bands, typically about 50 in size. Uh, several bands are clustered together into a clan of about 150. Several clans are clustered into a what's called a mega band of about 500. And then several mega bands cluster into a tribe uh, at about 1,500. And tribes are, are, are all the people that speak the same language or, or major dialect, um, as the case may be. So this is your ecological unit, this is a linguistic unit, and it's this scaling ratio here um, that uh, reflects uh, the, the fractal pattern. Um, interestingly enough, we find this same pattern in online multiplayer gaming environments. So here's a particular case done by and analyzed by one of my Austrian colleagues uh, for a, a gaming world called Pardus, which is in Austrian, so uh, and, and, uh, nobody else can understand it, but they have half a million players around the world. Um, and again, if you look at the size of different kinds of groupings that occur, so there's a classic multiplayer game in which you make alliances and you uh, um, uh, form cooperative arrangements with people to solve some uh, problem, for example, colonizing some star to obtain resources and so on. And if you look at the sizes of these groupings, um, what you get is, is these sizes here. Uh, and it just, if you do a Horton order analysis, again, effectively the, the um, slope on the line here uh, is um, a, a almost exactly three as well. So it seems that even on the um, virtual world environments, we stick to the kind of social structures that, that our, mind, our minds, the psychology of our minds is designed to manage. And again, uh, uh, these same structures turn out to be very common in those species of mammals that have complex multi-level social systems. So this is, these are quite rare in mammals and almost unknown in birds. Uh, here are two primates, uh, uh, baboons from, from Africa, from East Africa actually, um, elephants, um, and uh, these are African elephants, uh, and also the killer whales, the orcas, uh, uh, and it's probably true of the other, many of the other dolphins as well. Uh, these analyses have been done in the same way. They're Horton order analyses. Um, they're the reverse of the human ones I showed you. Um, uh, from before because they look at the number of groups uh, at each level rather than the size of the groups. But the principle is the same. Uh, the slopes you can see are all very, very similar. The numbers are very, very similar. Uh, the slopes give us a, a scaling ratio again of about three. So it looks like this pattern of a fractal pattern of, of uh, in the structure of both social organizations and social networks, personal social networks, uh, are very similar across all these species that have um, complex social systems, multi-level social systems that are similar to the kind we have. And indeed, it turns out that this is true of the distribution of group sizes in primates in general. So if you look at the average group sizes of, of all primates, monkeys and apes and prosimians, um, this is the pattern you get. These are prosimians, so uh, in South Asia, anyway, the, the, the main prosimians that you might be familiar with will be Tarsias. Uh, most of the other prosimians live in Africa. Uh, uh, Galagos, bush babies, and the lemurs from Madagascar. And then you have the monkeys and apes, the other main groups. So the primates are divided into these two main groups, the prosimians, and then on the other hand, the monkeys and apes. Uh, and the gray bars are the data for the monkeys and apes. Um, <clears throat> if we uh, look at the, 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 these distributions and ask how, what, what, what uh, mathematical distribution best describes these, and these are all the ones we've tried, um, again, uh, we find that they're best described by a compound Poisson 
distribution. So four independent Poisson distributions mapped on top of each other. Um, and specifically four is the answer. All these single um, uh, 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 distributions here, sing single mode distributions, uh, provide a very, very poor fit. So the fit here for, for, for those uh, who want to know the, the technical things, uh, is is done by by looking at the uh, Akaki uh, uh, information uh, index, and the smaller that is, the better it is. So this is the at least of this set is uh, the optimal set, and you can see it's much much smaller than any of the others. So it's, the reality is this is again also has this compound stru structure, and if you use cluster analysis, the same cluster analysis methods to find out where the modal peaks are, then we find that they're uh, here for the monkeys and apes, and here only three uh, peaks uh, or three separate distributions for the prosimians. But the, these prosimian patterns map very closely onto the primate ones. And of course, we sit out here on our own with a group size of 150 to make up the fourth, fifth layer, if not. Um, so what these are equivalent to is uh, essentially solitary species, which only occur in prosimians, which have very small groups, maximum of two, two individuals typically. Um, groups in, in monkeys and some prosimians that are monogamous pairs with uh, so two adults with some offspring. Uh, small harems of maybe about 15 animals uh, on average. So again, it's one male with maybe five females plus their offspring. Uh, and again, a small number of species that um, in the monkeys and apes, so these are primarily baboons and chimpanzees uh, in Africa that have for primates, these very large groups, 50 individuals. And then sitting in the middle uh, is a little group, this is where the most most of the macaques, for example, which you'll be very familiar with in Assam, uh, fall into this sort of intermediate grouping here. There's some uh, uh, um, uh, evolutionary reasons why that seems this extra grouping, if you like, comes in. But essentially, here we have the same patterns as we see in humans. So, what your social world and the general pattern for all these species seems to be is something that looks like this. You sit in the center of this uh, series of circles, you have round about one and a half very close intimate relationships. Uh, you have about five uh, um, um, very close friends and family, typically two family, two friends and one other from, from either side. Uh, these are embedded in a group of 15 uh, best friends, 50 um, uh, uh, good friends, uh, here's that circle of 150, which seems to demarcate our natural social grouping. Now, we, we know for humans that these layers go on further out. Uh, there's a layer at 500 and another at 1500, and there appears to be an outermost layer at about 5,000. Um, the, these are largely um, uh, memory problems. The, num the, the people that appear inside the red circle are people we have meaningful relationships with. And our, our social time really is uh, distributed among these layers to reflect that. So this layer here of five closest friends and family that you have, if you look at the time we devote to them, uh, we devote about 40% of our total social time and social effort, emotional effort to those five individuals. And then uh, as you go out through these layers, uh, the people in those layers get less and less time from us. But this layer here, the 10 people that make up this layer here, in addition to the inner core of five, these 10 people receive about 20% of our total social effort. So altogether, these 15 people receive about 60% of our, our social time and social effort. So it's highly So our problem has been to try and understand really... Uh, how these layers arrive. We understand how the group sizes come to be because they are um, uh, largely a consequence of the constraints imposed by the size of our brain. Um, 
and those effects seem to be extremely robust. That number of 150 turns up all over the place. Um, uh, for the benefit of the Salesian fathers uh, here, I, I might observe that the optimal congregation size for churches also appears to be uh, about 150. Um, and I remember uh, um, uh, uh, give, being at a conference at the um, Jesuit University at the Vatican um, some years ago, and I presented these data and said, you know, the, these are the natural sizes for social groups. And sitting behind me when I took my place again was uh, turned out to be the parish priests of uh, one parish in England. They were all Jesuits, uh, and that was why they were at the conference. And one tapped me, me on the shoulder and said, these numbers fit perfectly. Uh, our parish is about 500 people, but we have three Sunday Masses, so each one's about 150 people. And the three Sunday Masses never mix. They're completely separate, uh, and almost separate constituencies. So, uh, and we've, again, we picked this, this uh, number up in, in, in many analyses of, of uh, congregation sizes in, in both uh, Protestant and uh, 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 as well as Catholic churches. Um, so there seems to be something odd about this number that works particularly well. But our problem, if you like, beyond that is to understand why we have these structured layers to them. We've, in some senses, had three attempts to look at this, three separate attempts to look at this uh, using uh, mathematic, different mathematical approaches, uh, one of them, the first, the earliest one, uh, um, we did it all with different collaborators. Uh, 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 sorry, Professor, I'm disturbing you. Uh, uh, means yep. you have to present your screen again because one of the uh, one of the participants presented the screen wrongly. So you have to present the screen again, I think. Present your. Sorry. You have to present your screen again. Present your PPT again. So, yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Sorry for the interruption here, Professor Ganga. Sorry okay. for the interruption, ma'am. Uh, I request the, all the participants to kindly pin on the presentation of Professor Ganga, and the problem will be resolved. There is no need to represent the entire thing once again. I request yeah. the participants to kindly pin on Professor Ganga's presentation. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to just carry on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Professor. Yeah. You you can carry on. Okay, so yeah, we can take up any issues uh, 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 later on, maybe. So the th here are the three approaches we've tried. One has been an agent-based model, uh, which seeks to optimize the distribution of investment. And in, we took initially three types of relationship to kind of keep the, the problem uh, mathematically tractable if, if, uh, uh, or computationally tractable. Um, these were uh, um, strong relationships, medium relationships, and weak relationships. So essentially, they corresponded to the five layer, the 15 layer, and, and the 150 layer. And what we are, asked the model to do was to maximize the trade-off between two opposing benefits. One was foraging, um, so uh, investing time in foraging. Uh, and the other was in social benefits, and social benefits provided, uh, so forming social relationships, investing time in social relationships, um, provided benefits of protection and other uh, forms of um, social benefit. So that was one uh, approach. A second approach um, was uh, a, essentially a statistical decision model, um, which was based on investing effort or time in four types of relationships of different qualities. So as in the previous case, the uh, relationships uh, of different quality are providing different benefits, but in a context where community size is limited and time is, is constrained because our sense was that these are the two key issues here. And then finally, uh, and this has only just been published, um, an optimal decision model which attempted to look uh, at how information flow is optimized um, across uh, these networks. Now, the third one here, uh, at the moment, we, we've only done the model for uh, uh, the size, group size of 150, but uh, uh, my collaborators uh, in America are currently working on uh, the inner layers to see how they 
pan out. We'll come to those. Okay, so let's just talk through these three approaches. Here's the first one, the agent-based model. It's attempting to optimize social and foraging benefits that the uh, uh, individual has. It's a general model. It's considering not specifically humans, but uh, all essentially all mammals or, or any typical mammal, if you like. Uh, and a typical mammal has to feed, has to forage, uh, acquire food by investing time in, in foraging behaviors. And it has to form relationships, which again are very costly in terms of time, but provide different kinds of benefits. So in the model, 300 agents compete with each other. Um, we uh, 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 look at their fitness um, in terms of how effectively their particular strategies, so the agents have different kinds of strategies, they different ways in which they prefer to allocate their time to different kinds of activities and relationships. Um, their fitness at the end of the cycle is a combination of five different um, factors, all of which affect their ability to reproduce. Um, and essentially, uh, at the end of each generation, if you like, each, each cycle, uh, which, uh, which consists of 2,000 runs in, in itself, we look to see who are the most successful agents and who are the least successful agents out of the 300 and the 20% um, least successful agent die. This is a very conventional strategy in, in agent-based modeling of this kind, mainly as a tactic for keeping the um, population size uh, constant. Otherwise, it just gets computationally impossible if the population keeps expanding. Uh, so the 20% least successful agents die, and the 20% most successful agents reproduce at the end of each each generation. So they produce one offspring which has their uh, um, uh, uh, strategy characteristics. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, uh, four main um, uh, kinds of uh, strategies, essentially those that distribute their time uh, um, uh, randomly uh, with no particular uh, preference for any kind of individual. Uh, we have individuals that prefer to have a few, very few uh, uh, strong relationships and then don't really care about the rest. They, they distribute what time they have left over randomly among other people. Uh, we have a, a third strategy which um, prefers to have quite a large inner core um, uh, as opposed to a small inner core. Uh, Professor then, Dunbar, Professor Dunbar, yeah. your slides are not visible at this moment. You are presenting your slide. Slides are not visible. Yes. Okay, let me try and call them up again. Thank you. Okay. Can you see the screen yet? Uh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, now it is okay. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just just remind you. Uh, that this is the agent-based model uh, with these uh, 300 agents competing against each other with, with a random assortment of, of it, primarily four different strategies. Um, uh, people who invest, or individuals, agents that invest randomly in relationships, agents that prefer uh, just a very small number of strong friendships, if you like, uh, agents that prefer a um, larger number of uh, strong friendships, and then individuals that try and um, allocate their their um, uh, investment in in relationships in proportion to the payoffs that they can expect to get. And what? So we ran a very large number of of um, uh, um, uh, uh, models. Uh, each one uh, ran for fifty generations. Each generation, two thousand cycles. And then we looked at the outcomes once the, the uh, populations had stabilized, the model had stabilized in their distributions. We looked at where they, 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 they had stabilized the patterns, if you like, and then did a cluster analysis on that, that distribution. This is the picture you get. It's something like 90% of, uh, sorry, 80% of models come up with um, no preference strategies uh, being most common um, with uh, something close to about 150, getting up towards 150 kind of weak relationships. 
Uh, we have about 15% uh, of models or uh, runs that uh, end up with small core patterns um, in which you have um, uh, a very small number of, of weak and, and medium relationships, but most are weak, but as opposed to the no preference strategy, which has none at all here, we have some uh, inner core relationships. And then the large core relationships and the layered structures, and we're looking to match exactly, uh, to, to, to be classified here, uh, the, the outcome has to match exactly what we see in, 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 in human relationships, these 5, 50, 150 layers. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the layered structure we get in humans and other primates is extremely rare in, in naturally run populations, but the fit is very good. They're, they're producing very nicely about uh, the kind of layers uh, we should see and coming very close to 150. What's interesting here is this looks very much like what we see in nature because most mammals have uh, live in herds, which are unstructured. They so think of um, uh, herds of antelope uh, and so on. They have no special relationships in there. You have, a, you have uh, a, a, n a number, but not a huge number. It's probably about 15% maximum of uh, species that live in small um, uh, uh, groups, primarily monogamous groups, um, and some living in, in harems. But these structured layers, like we see in, in primates and humans, are extremely rare. And in fact, actually, uh, that, you know, that the model says that only about 0.1% of all species will have this kind of social system. And indeed, that's absolutely exactly right. About 0.1% of all mammals, or altogether 8,000 species of mammals, um, have uh, this layered structure. So we, we feel quite vindicated here that this, the layers are coming up out of decisions made by animals about investing in the trade-off between foraging on the one hand and the benefits of live having close friendships. Now, these benefits of having close friendship are primarily about protection from predators, protection from uh, being uh, harassed by other members of the group. Uh, they have very large effects on, um, uh, um, sorry, I'm just going back to see, I have a horrid feeling I've lost you. Okay, no, we're looking good. Um, I just thought for a minute I, I, I'd lost uh, lost uh, contact with you. Um, uh, these one of the key benefits, in addition to the, to to protection from predators, internal and external predators, uh, is health. So the, uh, the number of friends you have has a huge impact on your health and well-being and success in life not only in humans, but also in monkeys and apes. And there's lots of data showing this. Um, these, these layered structures, so if we look at these, the circumstances under which these layered structures occur, uh, they tend to occur when there are high benefits, which is what, what this uh, graph shows, high benefits from alliances. So you, uh, the, most of the, the values lie up here. Uh, so these are the where most of the values for groups that uh, match uh, the two different major uh, sets, the, the, the layered structure in the dark and the light, the large core structures, uh, they tend to have, uh, score very high on the effect of uh, benefits from alliance formation, so these kind of health and protection benefits, and very high on measures of well-being, so this is health and, and both, well, it's for us, it's psychological, mental well-being, as well as physical health. And to score rather low uh, on uh, in, uh, environmental risk here, so they occur in environments that are less risky, where resources are less um, variable in their uh, predictability, you can guarantee getting food, and um, uh, uh, low stress environments. So, and these are the, very much the kind of environments in which primates in particular uh, seem to live. Okay, so the second model really is a, a standard classic uh, statistical earn model um, from classical statistics. Um, we treat the layers as 
as though they were urns and you have uh, balls. Um, in a classic urn model, you, you, you put um, uh, uh, black and white balls in, in, in different urns or, or containers and uh, um, uh, uh, this is used to, to produce a, 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 a default um, uh, null hypothesis distribution in, in classical statistics. So we've used that same concept. The urns in this case are our layers. We have four layers, four urns. And if you like, the equivalent of the, the balls that are placed in the urns are simply the, um, your time investment that you have to make in relationships. Um, so again, there are payoffs here in terms of relationship uh, quality. So um, the more valuable relationships produce higher benefits. We don't specify what the benefits are. We simply say that they're higher. Uh, the um, uh, less costly relationships produce fewer benefits. Um, and here's the model here. Um, it's, it's simply a, a basically a binomial <clears throat> probability distribution is what it's based on. Uh, uh, here's the, the, the standard formula. It's a Bayesian uh, um, binary probability distribution. And the, the important uh, variable, it turns out, is this Lagrange multiplier here um, that uh, uh, seems to drive the whole system. Um, and here's uh, uh, how it drives it. it. It turns out, rather to our surprise, because we had no anticipation that this would happen at all. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the model actually reverses itself. So if you look at the, the proportion of all relationships, all links in the network sense that individuals have in the different circles, so we've, we've essentially got five circles here, the innermost circle, uh, five circle, uh, 15 circle, 50 circle, and 150 circle. You would expect to have very small numbers uh, in circle one, a few more in circle two, uh, a few more again in circle three, but lots and lots in circle five, the 150 circle. So here's the pattern of the fractal pattern that we normally expect to see. But what we found was that the model also predicted uh, an alternate outcome, as it were, in which the reverse was true, in which people had many more proportionately, remember this is just a fraction or proportion, so proportionately more inner circle relationships and very few outer layer relationships. So the red line is just the point of equality uh, between, between those two. Um, and we were very puzzled by this until we realized that this depended critically on the magnitude of the Lagrange multiplier here. So if the Lagrange multiplier was greater than zero, we got the classic pattern. If the Lagrange multiplier was less than zero, we got this inverse pattern. Um, uh, uh, and initially, we, we really didn't quite understand why we were getting this until it uh, became apparent to us that actually this depends, uh, the, the size of the Lagrange multiplier in this context really depends on the size of the community. And this made us think that perhaps this was a constraint on the number of relationships you can have, or if there's a constraint on the number of relationships you can have, um, because of your social circumstances, then this would tip you into one or other of these two alternate optimal states. So this is a phase phase change, classic phase transmission uh, issue. So we went back to look at the the, the standard pattern of um, uh, social networks that we see in, in normal populations. These happen to be data from a Spanish sample. Here are the Lagrange multipliers along, along the x-axis here for uh, individuals. So each, each, each uh, data, data point in effect is one individual. The y-axis is the frequency, the number of individuals. Um, uh, here's the mean scaling ratio of three. So if you look at the data, it looks like a nice normal distribution. Uh, uh, pitched very nicely around the scaling ratio of three, so that's the, the dotted black line here. And of course, in the past, we've looked at these data and said, oh yes, this is very nice. This is just a normal distribution. These are just random statistical effects, the outliers that you always get in a normal distribution. And we kind of didn't really look at the error variance around here, thought it was unimportant. Now, if you look at these data again, 
and you look at the uh, position of the Lagrange multiplier at zero here, uh, then what you find is, yes, most people are indeed in the uh, normal, if you like, uh, fractal pattern, uh, the pattern we've always found, um, uh, uh, a few close friends and many weak friendships. Um, but sure enough, there are a few people, a very small number of people, so we really didn't pay any attention to them, sitting out here in the um, uh, 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 region where um, the, the grain multiplier is less than zero. Um, so this may just um, uh, 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 think about the circumstances under which we might find these patterns. Uh, one is psychology. So these might represent extreme versions of introverts. And these people up here would be kind of more extroverts, as it were. So um, this might explain why you would get these kind of patterns. But it also occurred to us that there would be some people whose physical circumstances or social circumstances made it difficult for them to meet many people. And one uh, a, a classic case of that, oh, what, what I should just show was, yes, here's uh, th this group in here, with the, where the Lagrange multiplier is making zero, showing this nice a uh, uh, classic pattern, and these people, when you plot this, the distribution of their social groups, their social networks, you get this inverted pattern. So it occurred to us that the place to look was in immigrant communities. So we collated data on social networks in a number of uh, immigrant communities. I think these are Sikh immigrants uh, community from, um, they've actually been there, for, they're not recent immigrants, but they're still a small isolated community in Spain. And what we find here is exactly what we didn't expect to see. That, that although there are a few people who have um, a, a Lagrange multiplier greater than zero, the bulk of them, because they're, most of their social interactions are going on within a fairly small dispersed community, are in uh, the below zero, the sub-zero um, uh, uh, region and have these these inverted um, uh, uh, social networks. So it turns out that uh, not only is the distribution, how you choose to distribute your time to gain benefits from having relationships, friendships with people, uh, and, uh, but also what your social options are become very important. So the third one, um, which is much more complicated uh, uh, um, and, and somewhat difficult uh, to, to, to explain in simple terms, I think, um, really is looking for criticality points in the information flow in uh, social networks. So it's looking essentially for a phrase transition in which information suddenly flows very efficiently um, compared to other regions of, of, of the state space, if it were. So this is, this is a purely theoretical uh, mathematical analysis uh, it's slightly complicated um, uh, by the fact that it's considering two interacting networks. One is the actual external network that you're sitting within, so your network of friends. The other is your, your representation, the agent's representation of that network inside its brain. And it's the match between these two. Does, does your perception of how the network is structured correlate with how the network out there actually is structured? that is the important thing. And the constraint here is that the outer network, network A, um, uh, can influence network B, the inner network, but not vice versa. In other words, changes that happen in your external network of friends can influence your perception of how friends are related, but your perception of how friends are related can't influence, or actually influence the, the structure of the ex external real physical network. That's, important constraint and then what we're looking for is is the extent to which information bottlenecks cause information flow through the system to become inefficient because information gets trapped perhaps in in eddies in corners uh, 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 and doesn't um, uh, circulate very efficiently through the network as a whole and also the effect of temporal delays in the speed with which information uh, gets mapped from the external network to the internal network. And the, uh, the guys who did this, they're all physicists, uh, 
um, did it in two ways. They, they, one model was a simple Ising model. Uh, Ising models are, are largely, um, while they were, were designed originally to use, uh, to, to explain or to study uh, phase shifts in, in, in um, uh, uh, molecular states of, of, of molecules, uh, something like um, uh, uh, um, magnetic states, polarity. Um, and so they, they, they use the two-state model, that either you believe something or you don't believe something, and uh, how far does that uh, spread through the model. And the other was one of these new kind of uh, swarm intelligence models where information spreads uh, through um, uh, a network um, uh, uh, um, using different uh, uh, principles. So the question is, uh, at what size do the AMB networks inter intersect or correlate, if you like, yielding uh, a criticality in the physics sense? Of a phase transition is, is uh, another term that's sometimes used here. So here are their two, the results of their two models. These are the Ising uh, models, the Ising state models. They've tried it two different ways. One is the mean field model, the red um, uh, uh, data here. Uh, mean field models, everybody interacts with everybody else. Uh, so it's a free-for-all, if you like, the interactions completely random according to who you meet. And then in the second uh, model uh, is an attempt to control for model structure, really, in a very simple way. Um, the way it's often done, we've done it in the past, is to set the network on a lattice, uh, a 2D lattice in some form, um, often wrapped around the torus so that it's, it's continuous and doesn't have edges. Uh, and if whichever way you, you whichever uh, way you do this, um, <clears throat> uh, you get uh, a criticality point here, um, uh, uh, a very striking criticality point, which everything suddenly comes together and coordinates very quickly um, at somewhere around about uh, a population size of 130 individuals. And if you use the swarm models, um, uh, then again, you see this very striking uh, criticality up here. It, it rises slowly to it, but it drops away very fast beyond it. And this is exactly at 150. So what's happening here is there's something about the structure of models, uh, networks rather, at these particular values, which allows information to flow very fast or relatively speaking, very fast through the system. Uh, that doesn't happen when you're even small degrees either side of it, um, you know, uh, even down at 120 or up at 170, uh, it's less efficient as something that doesn't quite work. Um, and they've been uh, exploring these, uh, having, having established that, that, that um, 150 is one attractor, one sweet spot, if you like, They've been looking at the smaller scales, and, and what seems to happen is you get smaller and smaller. If you look this side, essentially, you would see um, other uh, uh, peaks uh, in here, which with, at a lower peak, um, so they're not as strong attractors, uh, but they're, they, they, they're at almost exactly the same places as where we see the layered structures, so 15 and, and 50. Um, and, if, and their argument for this being optimal is comes off this graph, which is essentially looking at the time delay in how quickly the internal and the external networks converge uh, on the same uh, structure, how quickly they correlate, if you like, in time. Um, uh, here's the, the, uh, uh, the blue line is, is the correlation uh, or the time delays, uh, normalized time delays for um, uh, uh, groups of 150, the red or orange is a group of 100, uh, 300, and the purple here is group of 600. And you can see as group size is increasing, uh, there is a longer lag between what's happening in the external uh, network and how that's represented in the network inside your brain. Um, that is also, that is drifting uh, uh, to the right to larger and larger values and also getting smaller, so, so the, the, the uh, peaks are at a, a lower level. There's something very strange in this sense 
about the value of about 150. It seems to work much more efficiently. So just to sum up, um, the human social network is very small. That's Dunbar's number, essentially. Our social networks and our social organizations are highly structured very often, so-called Dunbar graph. Um, uh, interestingly, this same layered structure with these same numbers is exactly the structure of all modern armies. Um, modern armies use these numbers to uh, create their, their organization, presumably because they have discovered over time that these numbers work better on the battlefield. Um, these numbers also appear in primate societies, so it's, we're simply doing what other monkeys make do, but we do it bigger and better because obviously we have a bigger brain to manage that. And it seems that the structuring is determined mainly by time constraints and the decisions that individuals make about how best to distribute their available social effort, whether that's measured in terms of time investment or emotional investment, to maximize the benefit we get from relationships to different qualities. So uh, I'll stop there and um, uh, uh, close down the uh, sharing and we can go back to the screen uh, where we can all uh, see each other again. So hopefully you'll all reappear shortly. Uh, and Professor Dutta, I hand, I hand the baton back to you. Thank you, Professor Rabin. Initially, you said you are not a mathematician, but you are speaking everything just like a great mathematician. You are not only a great psychologist, but at the same time, you are a great mathematician. Your whole lecture is comprising of a lot of mathematical concepts. And it is wonderful that you have compiled so many different concepts in one lecture. And this is really very, very great. And we, the academic community of Don Bosco University, is really very much grateful to you. And your very wonderful and excellent talk will remain as a source of inspiration and motivation to all our young generations. And thank you very much, Professor Robin. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Robin, can I request you to give uh, some of uh, to answer some of the questions? We have received so many nice questions from different participants. And for the few minutes, let us have a discussion on this question. And I request Professor Robin to respond to our question. Hi, Dr. Sanjay Dutta, our faculty member. Please raise questions, some of the important questions. Yes, sir. So the first question is, mm -hmm. can we design cognitive computer that learn continuously from the social experience? Ah, this is a very interesting question, actually. I, I think the very short answer is yes, in principle. Uh, but I'm only going on the extent to which uh computers or ai software is extremely good uh, in in the sense of neural net uh, uh, learning uh, at learning um it, 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 uh, structures in the world as it were uh, um, um, propositions about the world and, and so on so i think the answer i you know i'm not a computer scientist so i, I really can't say but i i have great great belief and confidence in the cleverness of um, uh, computer uh, software engineers for being able to do almost anything uh, if they, so long as they understand the problem first. So my view is I'm explaining the problem to them here. I'm, I will wait to see whether they can solve that problem uh, effectively in, in a, a computing environment. I, I believe that it's perfectly possible. It's not beyond human ingenuity to do it anyway. Let's say. Okay. The second question uh, the participant have asked, how can the mathematical equation will be incorporated in stimulation and automation? Uh, <clears throat> can we do that? Again, well, yeah, I, I again, you know, I, I'm not a computer scientist, so it's hard for me to say. All I, what I will say 
is there have been th these ideas have been used now in two separate uh, uh, examples of uh, software for detecting um, uh, bots in the one case and uh, detecting um, trustworthy individuals on mobile phone uh, data sets. So the, the uh, big problem of pervasive adaptation uh, that the mobile phone industry is interested in is can they get a, just, uh, remove all the static masks which nobody likes? Can they use the phones themselves as the way stations for uh, jumping your message? Uh, your phone call from you to whoever you're trying to call in, in the other side of India, that they can use everybody else's phones in between as the kind of way stations. And in both of these, they, they've used these ideas to design trust software that allows them, the phones, if you like, to detect whether, or the computer to detect whether uh, the person there or the, the, the phone, the software uh, um, it, it is trustworthy or not, uh, and particularly in, in one case for identifying bots. And it's, it turned out that using uh, these patterns of interaction that we get in, in social networks that we observe in real social networks is actually much more efficient as a bot detection uh, mechanism than any of the conventional bot detection mechanisms currently in use. So that's my best guess for you. Okay. So just one more question. Um, can skin conductance responses be used to indicate when we see something that grabs our attention? Uh, the answer is yes. This, this is a well-established effect in um, uh, psychophysiology, I think, that uh, if you um, uh, are aroused in some way, either by uh, fear of something or by pleasure of, of something you see, then this is reflected in, in skin conductance. So um, uh, it, it's perfectly possible to hook that up uh, to, to uh, um, uh, look at how we respond to the quality of different relationships the big problem we have in in many ways is is really how to decide whether uh your best friend really is your best friend or you're just saying it's your best friend to be polite um and we don't really have any strong measures we have some neuroimaging measures where you can measure the activity in people's brains which is if you like very similar to the skin conductors but skin conduct uh, using brain scanning technology is is very difficult because it's uh, you know the machines are the size of a room that you have to sit in so it's not easy to carry these around and measure people's friendship quality in the street but maybe skin conductance is a very simple way of doing it so it's worth trying thank uh, thanks dr sanjoy and i have one question sir professor danbar uh, what is the Horton order analysis? We explain the Horton order analysis. Yes. So, so this this is a, a, um, an, a, an analysis that's used simply to identify fract fractal structures. It's a very simple graphical one. You really have to know that you already have fractal fractal structures to do it. So mm -hmm. that works quite well in this case because we believe these grouping patterns already exist. We can see them in front of our eyes, so we can describe them, therefore we can measure either their frequency or their average size. And if you uh, simply uh, place the, the um, layerings, the groupings in order of notional order of size, as in the, the um, uh, concentric circles uh, that I showed you from uh, friendship relationships, uh, if you know that they exist and you know their order, you can place them in order and then uh, you can plot the, the frequency or the, the um, average size. And what you're looking for is whether the um, uh, uh, regression line through those data points then are um, uh, in linear or not. If they're not linear, then there's no fractal structure. If they're linear, then you have a fractal structure. And so Okay, the regression is, of course, going to be anything. 
between a bit bigger than one and I guess infinity if it's very very steep. But it, it, Thank you very much, Professor uh, Danbar again. And we have received so many different questions from different participants. And we are very sorry that because of the time constraint, it is not possible to discuss everything here. But uh, at the end, we will try to compile with all requests and all answer. And we will send all the possible answer to their respective uh, email. And now okay. we will be moving to the second Excuse speaker. Me, Our second speaker also will be interesting talk. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir. Yes. Is it possible? I would like to ask you a question. Is it possible? Just a few seconds. Okay, you please raise your question. What is yeah. your question, please? Uh, sir, uh, actually, it's from your one of your uh, literature that is uh, co evolution of neuro, uh, neurocortical size. So, my question is how the scenario of chaos means how the chaos theory is going to explain the human social relationship that has changed over the time from years after years, for our, uh, we can say after decades after decades, how the uh, chaos theories or that chaos can explain that. Sir, kindly, <laughs> it will be a great help for me. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, the, the, the answer is we actually used entropy as uh, in part of the second mathematical analysis, the, the Bayesian um, uh, 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 probability earn model. Um, uh, that, that was based around, around the concept of entropy. Um, uh, the answer is um, uh, I think it becomes most relevant in that. Uh, 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 in the sense implied by the third uh, model that I talked about, um, the, the uh, criticality model, the, the phase transition model, that things become chaotic if your community size is too big. Um, there's a very good lesson here for every university, every government department, every school, every hospital, every business, is how you structure your organization so that you keep within these numbers because it seems that if you have units which are too big then what you get is is complete chaos because inflammation flow doesn't throw around, throw around the system too well that's my best guess for you thank you very much thank you we want to close down question and answer at this moment and before going to the second speaker uh, could I address our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Father Dr. Stephen, to present your slide if possible? Because uh, he failed to present his slide at his welcome address. I am now requesting our Honorable Vice Chancellor to present his slide if possible. I will try. Okay, sir. Did it come through? Uh, it Did is it? not appearing. It is not appearing. I think present, click the present now and then enter screen and then push on the that camera type in the middle and share. I think slide will appear. I put share.
Is it coming through now? Uh, sorry, uh, Hadar, uh, it is not appearing. Okay. You go ahead with the next speaker. Uh, I think uh, I think you click present now and then the entire screen. Okay. And then one camera type picture will come. And you push in the button uh, in the middle and then share. I think slide should come. Uh, what is the technical problem? I think I don't know. Okay. The sharing is not going through what happened. Uh, is there any technical person in your office? Um, I, I, I press here. No? Press now. Then there's the. Okay. I'm still not getting the presentation out. This is how I did last time it went through. Okay. Mm. Okay. Present now, no? Present now. Right. Ah, yes. Now it is coming. Yes. Okay. Thanks. It is coming. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you, that's done. Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected father. Uh, really, Assam Don Bosco University has a very beautiful green campus. And all are most welcome to visit our university for academic programs. <laughs> OK, now our second speaker is a very young mathematician, very brilliant mathematician. Dr. Santonu Asarjo, and he is a brilliant teacher, and more interestingly, he has been working in collaboration with Professor Dunbar in the field of mathematics, psychology, neuroscience, etc. And because of his collaboration or because of his outstanding ideology, he has published a good number of research papers in different standard journals all over the world. And because of the many academic activities, he has visited USA, Canada, South Korea, China, UAE, Turkey, and many different countries. And he is a regular reviewer of many standard journals, many mathematical reviews of many international academic society and we are very pleased that dr santonu has agreed to give the webinar talk today 
And title of his talk is uh, Dunbar Crafts and Their Future Prospect. May I now request Dr. Santonu to present his talk? Thank you, sir. It's uh, am I audible to all of you? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, it is audible. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's my great pleasure uh, to to be here with all of you, and uh, I'm also thankful to Assam Non Bosco University for inviting me to uh, deliver my talk, uh, Dunbar's graph and its future perspective, uh, in front of all of you. So I'm thankful to everyone, and I'm thankful to uh, all the uh, faculty members. Vice Chancellor, sir, and everyone, every member of the uh, Assam Don Bosco University. Uh, before uh, going to Dunbar's numbers, so I, I think that uh, I want to just uh, allow me to present my screen. Uh, and Uh, uh, slide is not appearing, Santonu. Uh, your slide uh, is not visible. Uh, hi, Dr. Santonu. Are you hearing me? And we are not seeing your presentation. Your slide is not visible. Oh, okay. Okay. Now it's, it is coming. Yeah, hello. Am I audible? Am, am I audible, sir? Yes, Dr. Chantanu, please go on. Yes, sir. Is the screen visible now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone. So today my uh, talk uh, will be on Dunbar's graph and their future perspective. So before starting, Sir, it is not audible. Maybe network issue. Am I, am I audible right now? Yes. So when I'm just uh, sharing the screen, so probably 
due to the network it's not working is it now visible to all of you yes 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 so before going to uh, start uh, my talk so i am requesting all of you to please inform me if there will be any network issue from uh, my side uh, so that i'll be informed so uh, the dunbar's graph and their future perspective so after uh, listening the talk of professor dunbar so i think uh, all of we are familiar about what is dunbar's number and uh, dunbar's curve little bit but uh, i am now going to discuss about the uh, mathematics behind dunbar's curve that we recently published in a paper uh, joint paper and it was published in the journal symmetry so contents of my talk is uh, will be on dunbar's number so dunbar's graph future perspectives of dunbar's graphs so before going to the mathematics of the dunbar's graph so we should uh, know the, what is the importance of dunbar's graphs and why i connect uh, dunbar's number with the graphs so social networks have become a topic of major interest in recent years so in the social networking there are the two perspective one is the global networking and another one is the local networking if you think about the local networking so it means simply that uh, a person has his own friend circle or his uh, social uh, acquaintances so that network is according to the topic of the social network it's local network okay so basically i am uh, interested in uh, uh, studying the local network from the perspective of dunbar's number and uh, six degrees of separation so many studies have focused on the size and structure of egocentric networks that already professor dunbar discussed the world is seen uh, from the individual's perspective rather than taking top down overview of the global network as a while so this result has a very two important findings the first finding is that uh, size of an individual's network is typically about 150 people in the size and uh, 150 means that we can maintain the stable relationship with uh, or maximum 150 people uh, although we may have um, 500 and 1500 people but we can maintain only 150 friendships uh, with a very known um, way and the second one is that uh, these networks have a very distinct layer structure so those layers have a special factor relationship uh, this is strongly suggestive of the possibility that they grow naturally as a result of the uh, accretion of nodes over time these layers uh, with the same numerical size that's 5 15 50 150 and i'm just uh, not writing 500 and uh, 1500 because we are only focusing on the stable relationship so one can study also dunbar's graph from the perspective of 500 and 1500 people so it's not a very big deal so perhaps so uh, so now the question is that dunbar's number is not only available or in um, offline network but it is also available in our daily life that is in online way even the facebook twitter instagram all these things follows dunbar's number and they are experimentally proven that dunbar's number is there that is we can maintain only maximum 150 stable relationship no matter we can say that okay in my facebook i have 5000 or 6000 followers or 5000 or 6000 friends but in reality our neuro neurocortex size and the brain uh, allows us to maintain a stable relationship with maximum 152 persons so dunbar's numbers uh, can be present in uh, is found to be present in structure of personal social networks under gather associ communities facebook and twitter graphs email networks uh, co-authorship network in science the organization of modern armies alliances in online gaming environments calling patterns of cell phone database and trader networks on stock exchanges so i think that professor dunbar already uh, shared uh, light on all these aspects uh from his uh, dunbar's number and with uh, suitable mathematics and graphs so i will discuss about the Dun uh, dunbar's graph so the constant on both the networking size and structures are due to in a part uh, of the cognitive limits on the number of people who can be known as individual that is uh, social ben hypothesis and in part on the constant uh, that time imposes on the capacity to interact 
so wilson et al uh, they conducted uh, one experiment and uh, they found that uh, the social network uh, social interaction graph of facebook uh, at that time in 2011 uh, <coughs> Uh, has some uh, restrictions and these constants are reflected individuals willingness to do favor for each other alters who lie in each other in our most that is 5 and 15 uh, hierarchy circles layers are most likely to offer help that means uh, it simply says that uh, let's take some of the worst example suppose my uh, my some relative uh, die okay so when my relative dies so you can check that uh, in general we always call very near person to inform that okay my relative died that means in the very crucial situation we get uh, support from the innermost core of the dunbar circle hierarchy level that is 5 and 50 and then we get uh, help from our stable relationships in 50 and 5, 1000 uh, 100 500 so and then people who lie in each other outermost or uh, 50 to 1000 100 that's already i said so now an alternative and perhaps better known approach of the social networking is based on the milgram's uh, experiment so uh, in if you uh, if anyone study social network they uh, can uh, be fam- they may be familiar with uh, stanley milgram's uh, famous uh, experiment uh, on studying uh, the social world phenomena and that social world phenomena is a very important even uh, i can uh, tell you that uh, there was a 19 uh, there was a movie or perhaps serial i am not uh, actually remember that whether it is movie or serial in 1991 with the name social networking uh, sorry small uh, small degree uh, small world phenomena so what is the importance of this uh, small world phenomena is that an alternative and perhaps better known approach to social network has been developed by stanley milgram in 1960 which adopts a small world perspective and focuses on what has become known as the six degrees of separation so the idea of six degrees of separation at first not came into the mind of uh, stanley milgram so it is interesting to find that the idea of the six degree freedom was gener- uh, was written in a very very short story uh, written by hungarian writer frejes kerante so who wrote uh, who wrote a short story entitled the landsmark uh, in english chains in this uh, in this story kerante introduced uh, for the first time the concept of six degree of separation so i can uh, suggest to every participants of this program that if you want to uh, do uh, science or do research so try to uh, like literature and try to read literature what is the importance of this literature study you can understand from this simple example that milgram's experiment just uh, created a, a a new area of research social networking but the idea of milgram's uh, experiment was from a literature written by a, a short story um, of uh, freje kerante so let our social psychologist stanley milgram uh, reinvented the same concept as kerante through uh, a now famous experiment so according to milgram the small world problem was generated from the following question so given any two people x and z how many intermediate acquaintances are uh, linked together uh, or are needed before x and z are connected so often six degrees of separation is also known as small world phenomenon that means uh, it simply says that suppose i am considering myself and i am interested to send a parcel uh, to queen elizabeth who is not uh, known to me and i am not directly known to queen elizabeth sitting in london but i can send here her uh, that uh, parcel uh, through my uh, known person and uh, it can be it is experimentally proven that uh, maximum six people will be needed uh, for the parcel to be reached uh, to uh, queen elizabeth and that's why we call it is a uh, small world uh, phenomena so so milgram found that on uh, average five intermediates uh, suffice to link any two randomly uh, chosen individual no matter where they lived in the united states so after the 1967 experiment written uh, done by stanley milgram he co-authored with uh, travers and he wrote the joint paper uh, 
in the name of the Western Milgram, or they considered uh, an uh, population of uh, n equal to 296 uh, in uh, Nebraska, where uh, who are asked to generate acquaintance chains uh, to target person in Boston, Massachusetts, employing the small world uh, method of Milgram. So what they found, they found that 64 chains reach uh, the target person in Boston. In this experiment, the main number of intermediates between st uh, starters and targets was found to be 5.2. Thus, the phenomenon is known as six degrees of separation. Now, in the 2013, that uh, sorry, 2003, that is after the evolution of uh, social networking sites or uh, internet. So, a global social search was conducted with more than 60,000 uh, email users. In this experiment, uh, they considered 18 target persons in 13 countries and they found that social searches reached the target in five to seven steps. So it was reported that the average degrees of separation between two individuals in the networks of mentee mentor relationship in pediatric, uh, pediatric psychology was uh, 5.30. So all these are based on the experimental evidences with some uh, mathematics where you can find very less mathematics, but I can tell you that mathematics is uh, highly used in social network with the Dunbar's number. So next one is that after the evolution of online social networking sites, uh, it was reported that average number of intermediates across 721 million uh, people using the Facebook site in 2011 was 3.74. And uh, hopefully all of you will be glad to know that this, uh, that the experiment of the 2011 was conducted by the researcher of Facebook itself. So we can understand that Facebook is also interested to generate uh, uh, revenue from their business and they, also, uh, they are also interested to do research on how social networks are formed with Denver's number and uh, Milgram's, uh, Milgram's experiment. So five years later, a group of researchers at the Facebook research, same team, reported that the average separation was 3.57. That means uh, it simply says that uh, after the evolution of uh, social networking, our uh, small world phenomena reduced to four. Previously, it was six in case of uh, offline social networking. Now it's uh, four. So in 2014, when there were uh, 1.6 billion users of Facebook, it was found that 3.9 as average number of acquaintances separated any two people in Facebook social network, no matter who they are. In case of Twitter, it is also interesting that it is found 3.43 as an average degree of separation between any two random Twitter users. So, so the thing is that one possible explanation for different uh, difference in these two estimates of the small world constant is that uh, evolution of online social not networking sites has helped to reduce the number of links needed because computational algorithms can search more efficiently than humans can for minimum parts. Again, if I consider from the perspective of Dunbar's number, so we are familiar that we can maintain stable relationship up to 150. So there is a very interesting uh, uh, connection. Probably we can think that there may be some very interesting connections. In one side, we are telling that uh, social networking sites uh, has uh, uh, have been reduced uh, the social distances uh, in case of online network and again we are telling that uh, we can maintain stable relationship up to 150 so what's the problem behind it so that was our motto to introduce Dunbar's number to the world of uh, research on social networks so my question was that do people search the whole of their personal social network when deciding how to start off a milgram's small world chain it means that Suppose I want to send the uh, send the um, that is parcel to Queen Elizabeth. So, shall I uh, search uh, everyone from my network, and I will request them so uh, to send the uh, parcel to the next one, or shall I relay um, depend on some uh, reliable person of my um, social networking sites, and then I will uh, tell him or her to pass it to the next one of his uh, familiar persons or acquaintances. So that was my concern. And that we focused uh, 
on our paper or do they search uh, preferentially among enormous layers of best friends who are more likely to agree to any request for such favor it simply means that or can i say uh, that uh, i will request uh, my relative uh, which will lie between uh, 15 uh, hierarchy hierarchy level of 15 people or 50 people and i will tell them you just pass this uh, to your uh, a friend so that it will reach to uh, queen elizabeth or so on so that was uh, interesting fact from this perspective of uh, milgram's experiment and dunbar's number so in considering this question a further issue to bear in mind is that the limits of dunbar's social network are only population averages uh, there is a considerable considerable variation around these values at the individual level within populations so what uh, kalish and robbins found kalish and robbins found that an effect of both uh, neurotism and extroversions on the quality of an individual social network extroverts are more energetic outgoing and sociable than introverts Roberts et al showed that the extroversion is correlated with the size of the support clique that is five layer though not the size of uh, though not the size of sympathy group the 15 layer so we can think that if i am an extrovert person so i will not uh, give my parcel to anyone whom i don't know very well because i am the extrovert person and i have a very less friend so i will try to figure out or try to find out any person between the five layer um, support layer support clique or support layer of five uh, people or maximum i can go up to 15 layer so other studies have uh, reported similar results that social world consists of two phenotypes these two uh, those who have small social circles and who are more uh, like social butterflies and have uh, much larger networks so age has uh, some limits age has similar effects uh, younger adults tend to have a larger network say 100 150 to 250 whereas older adults have similar sm smaller networks of uh, a range from 100 to 150 so this suggests that uh, it may be important uh, to take personality into account when analyzing the size of the structure of social network so in order to evaluate and compare networks uh, we need a methodology that reflects the dynamic of networks rather than uh, the more conventional static network indices such as path length or degree so uh, before going to uh, next topic uh, that is topological indices or the mathematical part so am i uh, i'm asking to all of you am i audible till now am i audible to everyone yes yes Let's go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, a topological index uh, can be defined as a real-valued function from the graph G to a, so the set of positive real numbers, which maps every uh, molecular structure G into a non-negative real number. So, topological indices basically uh, indices which is used in uh, theoretical chemistry, and it is. Uh, Prior to our work, uh, we can tell that uh, hardly anyone found uh, find any applications of theoretical chemistry in social network on, or Dunbar's number. So this was our first report where we can work on. So, so general randic index is given by uh, R suffix alpha and G is the graph of the network. So it is the summation of uh, the age UB, uh, that is UB is your... <coughs> the age in the set of ages and uh, du dv to the power alpha so what is d suffix u d suffix v d suffix u is the uh, degree of the node u and degree of the node v so to the power alpha so if alpha equal to minus half then it reduces to randic index so first jagrab index is defined by uh, m1 m suffix 1 g and it is nothing but the summation uh, that is ages belong to u the set of the ages containing u and v and it is summation du plus dv and if alpha equal to one then this randic index reduces to second jagrib index that is m2 m suffix 2g and if alpha equal to minus one the general randic index uh, reduces to the second modified jagrib index so similarly uh, there are some other index uh, so i will come to the uh, later about the importance of index 
the inverse sum index of the graph is uh, defined by i sub uh, ig where uh, it is equal to summation uv belongs to set of the edges uh, uh, d suffix u d suffix v divided by du dv that is the sum uh, product of the degree divided by sum of the degree containing u and v similarly we define harmonic index and augmented jagger index and symmetric division indices so these are the some available indices in uh, theoretical chemistry so importance of this uh, indices is to classify a network based on the degree and their uh, uh, networking uh, information flow that is information i am not talking about the information of uh, signaling or all these things i am talking about the molecular information so i thought uh, that uh, before uh, going to any other branches so i considered a particular person as a molecule and then i uh, uh, declare, uh, decided to work with professor dunbar that we will generate this graph uh, and we will work on it based on uh, theoretical chemistry so so let's come to uh, uh, the dunbar's graph and it's a first of all it's an example so so then i will come to the definition so it's a 4 comma 3 comma 3 agent recruitment gram so it's a very simple structure it's a graph of having very simple structure so suppose i am considering the person zero as myself so i have the four persons uh, which are known to me that is one two i'm just a little bit uh, making it bigger for your visualization so i am uh, considering 1 2 3 4 as my pers as the persons my, i know and the person one knows other three person so 7 6 5 again uh, person two knows 8 9 10 again three knows similarly 10 3 and four knows again three person similarly you can check in the last layer uh, six uh, the layer before the last layer six knows three person that is 20 21 20 i am numbering them as the person 20 20 20 21 22 20, similarly seven uh, knows the person 23 24 25 20, so this is 4 comma 3 comma 3 agent recruited gram so why it's 4 comma 3 comma 3 because i am uh, known to four persons so it's first layer is four and three means the all the members of my uh, known person okay that is in the first layer they have the three acquaintances again the rest of the uh, uh, persons in the second layer they have also uh, three friends of each so it's a 4 comma 3 comma 3 agent recruitment graph so why these types of graphs are important because these types of graphs are representing uh, dunbar's graph in terms of generalization so consider uh, already already uh, i discuss about the um, example so now i'm coming to what is dunbar's graphs consider a set of these dunbar graphs linked uh, to a common individual at uh, different layers to each other to create a small world chain to represent we introduce m and r agent recruitment graph that means we are trying to generalize our 4 comma 3 comma 3 agent recruitment graph as m comma n comma r agent recruitment graph so where n is greater than 1 to uh, provide its uh, a formal description uh, of this graph uh, with the m polynomial so m polynomial is a topological uh, invariant in terms of graph so this new kind of multi network or global network graph has uh, both m polynomial and topological indices uh, based on the layer structures and the number of agents in each layer so if i consider m and r it means that in my first layer Uh, so in place of mnr means in place of uh, my first layer you can check in place of my first layer uh, there will be m persons and all m persons each of the m persons have n per n known persons and total how many uh, circles that is how many circular uh, uh, shapes will be there uh, around me there will be r so you can check that here 4,4 4,3,3 4, so that is a generalization m comma n comma r is an improvement graph so we can therefore uh, derive a set of topological invariants for social networks that really relate the inverse number uh, represented by coefficient m and n to the small world uh, degrees of separation concept by r that means uh, in our n comma n comma r we will uh, consider 
that m and n based on the dunbar's number and r based on the social networking common phenomena that we uh, got from experiment as well as from uh, theory uh, so let's come to our mathematical part so suppose g is a graph with uh, the set of vertex v and set of edges e and theta suffix ij where i comma j greater than equal to 1 be the number of edges uh, E equal to u b i am denoting e as the h u u b of graph g such that uh, the set of uh, degree of uh, u and degree of b is nothing but the i and j then n polynomial is uh, defined to be as uh, summation i less than equal to j theta i j bracket g g means graph x to the power i y to the power j this is the m polynomial so there is a very interesting uh, connection which we can establish from uh, m polynomial with uh, our previous uh, discussed uh, topological indices that is first degree index second degree index uh, second modified index landing index and so up to uh, augmented degree index and you can find that uh, there is a relation between topological index i'm just uh, making it a little bit bigger so topological index uh, if i consider that is m1 j it is nothing but d suffix x and d suffix y where f of x y such that x equal to y that means don't uh, don't be confused that d means they are derivative with respect to uh, x or y it has some specific notion where we will consider if after uh, doing the calculation if i uh, substitute x and y equal to 1 in that equation then we have some topological indices like first degree index so according to duets and calvasier so you can check that uh, d suffix x is nothing but x the partial derivative of f uh, x comma y that is the with respect to x similarly d suffix y is nothing but y into partial derivative of f x comma y that is with respect to y and similarly s suffix x s suffix y q suffix uh, alpha and j suffix f x comma y which keeps f x comma y that means uh, when i considering the operator j you can think about uh, as a operator not a big deal so j suffix f x comma y is equal to f x comma x so i'm little trying to also i'm also trying to little bit uh, making little bit uh, easier for those who are non mathematical so so i'm using some general term along with mathematical term so now coming to the definition of mnr agent recruitment graph a graph uh, g is said to be mnr agent recruitment graph where n greater than equal to 1 if it has a vertex of degree m in first layer then each of m vertices has a degree n in second layer and so on up to r minus 1 layer but degree of each vertex in uh, is 1 in r layer so it is the definition of our mnr agent recruitment graph so in case of our mnr uh, agent recruitment graph so suppose we denote uh, uh, vg v vector j that is what set of the vertex and set of the edges as e uh, and if uh, if uh, g indicates mnr agent recruitment graph where n greater than equal to g then the set of the vertex contains 1 plus m n to the power r minus 1 uh, divided by n minus 1 and the set of edges contains m whole n to the power r minus 1 by n minus 1 so using these two results so we calculated the degree of vertex uh, degree of vertex and the, their number of vertices so we found that in the mnr agent recruitment graph there are uh, vertex with there are vertex with degree 1 as m n to the power r minus 1 uh degree with m as number of vertices 1 and then as n plus 1 is m n to the power r minus 1 minus 1 then divided by n minus 1 similarly we calculate the h degree table this yeah. degree table is based on the degrees that is 1 comma n plus 1 it means that if i have the h then in one side it has the it has a, it is a vertex with degree 1 and in other side it has a uh, vertex with uh, degree n plus 1 so we got the number of edges as m n to the power r minus 1 and so on for uh, rest of the cases we got it so for the sake of easiness of calculation so we consider that beta equal to m n r to the power n minus 1 gamma as n and delta equal to m n n to the power r minus 2 minus 1 by n minus 1 now 
what uh, we are doing that suppose e1 e suffix 1 g and e2 suffix g e3 suffix g be the set of edges u b belongs to the set of edges whose uh, indices uh, vertices have the degree 1 and n plus 1 next one is m and n plus 1 and n plus 1 and n plus 1 it simply means that e1 will contain those edges which has one, a vertex with degree 1 and other vertex with degree n plus 1 and similarly for e2, e2, <coughs> j and e3, j. So thus theta we indicate uh, as theta suffix 1 n plus 1 is nothing but the number of edges in the set e1 it's equal to beta. Similarly theta m n plus 1 is equal to gamma and theta n plus 1 n plus 1 is equal to delta. So now using the uh, polynomial m polynomial so we got uh, m g x comma y as we defined earlier it's equal to summation i less than equal to j theta i j x to the power i y to the power j and we got the line that uh, final line as beta x y to the power n plus 1 uh, plus gamma x to the power m y to the power n plus 1 plus delta x to the power n plus 1 y to the power n plus 1 so i consider this polynomial as uh, the function of two variables that is f x comma y so i calculated uh, we calculated uh, that is the capital D suffix x, the operator D suffix s by using the formula and we got it, it is beta x to the power x y to the power n plus 1 plus m gamma x to the power m y to the power n plus 1 and plus n plus 1 delta x to the power n plus 1 y to the power n plus 1 and similarly I we got uh, we got uh, the other calculations uh, based on our operator that is d suffix y then uh, dx dy and then sx sy so we got this uh, we got this uh, calculation it's very easy even uh, a student of class uh, 11 or 12 can uh, calculate this uh, calculations so finally after calculating all these things so we are required to find we are required to find those uh, types of uh, formula or the uh, connection between the uh, m polynomial and our topological indices. So we got it uh, as uh, you can check here. We got it uh, that uh, s suffix x that's the last one s suffix x j dx uh, dy and it is nothing but of this form uh, which is written in the slide. Similarly, other forms. So these are simply calculations. So we got it, and now after having the calculations based on the required formula so now we have some results regarding that m n comma r m n r agent graph suppose g b a m n r agent recruitment graph then uh, our first uh, Zagreb index is nothing but equal to m n r minus 1 n plus 2 plus m n to m plus n plus 1 plus m n n to the power r minus 2 minus 1 n minus 1 2n plus 1. Similarly, I got the second Zagreb index. Uh, it is written here. So I'm just uh, uh, keeping the slides for one second for everyone so that they can uh, uh, check the uh, answer. That is second Zagreb index equal to m n r minus 1 n plus 1 plus m square n plus 1 and the rest of the part. So similarly, next I consider the modified Zagreb index that is uh, m m2 and then R alpha is the Randic index of uh, alpha, generalized Randic index. Then R alpha is the modified Randic index. So these are the mathematical calculations that we calculated in our published paper. And this is the standard uh, derived Zagreb index. That is, uh, last middle one is that harmonic Zagreb index. And uh, it is inverse Zagreb index. So we calculate based on our MNR agent recruitment graph. Now, after, and this is the augmented Zagreb index. So we calculated it. And interesting fact is that on calculating it, what we got, uh, we got a very interesting picture of the social networking based on the offline and online social networks. So now the idea of the Dunbar graphs and topological indices come into the place. So we can consider, uh, now we can determine the topological indices for a set of graphs that differ in their size and structure in a way we suggested in introduction. So we consider all possible combinations of M N values of Dunbar's layer that is 5, 15, 150 and R equal to 4, 
and r equal to 6 so why i did not consider 50 people may raise question so i will uh, tell the answer if someone will ask me the question so i'm giving uh, this for you to think for a while so r equal to 4 means we can check in our uh, experiment uh, by other uh, researchers that in case of uh, offline social uh, sorry online social network the 6 degree separation reduced to the value of 4 that is so r equal to 4 and in case of uh, offline uh, network so r equal to 6 thus we consider r equal to 4 and r equal to 6 so it's simply a matter of interpolating this values into the equations that we got in terms of nine theorems and uh, probably the picture is not clear uh, but anyway i i can just uh, tell you uh, this is the first uh, that is the element in the first row and first column it's 5 uh, 5 6 so when i put m equal to 5 n equal to 5 and r equal to 6 it simply means that it's a denbar graph where i am familiar to five persons that means i am fully extrovert and my and my five friends has five persons okay they are also extroverts and there are social network and the social network is offline so r equal to 6 then we calculate the that is first jagrib index second jagrib index and the remaining other similarly you can check that in the second um, second uh, element of second column and first row it's 5 50 and 6 it means that i am extrovert so i am extrovert not only extrovert i am highly extrovert probably i am not uh, f- uh, i don't like to go outside i don't like to enjoy parties or all these things you can think about myself as a highly extrovert person if i am uh, the, uh, just uh, showing you the 5 156 so i am extrovert so i have the five people who are, who are known but they are not extrovert they are inter- uh, sorry uh, sorry i am extremely sorry uh, five means i am introvert and 150 mean they are extrovert okay i'm extremely sorry for this uh, mistake uh five is introvert and 150 is extrovert and again six means it's a offline network so we calculated all the calculations and we can uh, check with uh, 550 150 and all these things so after calculating this we got a very interesting uh, result and it matches with the experimental predictions of kilor so theoretical verification of experimental results of kilor that so i am uh, glad to tell that kilor predicted from the experiment and it was before uh, appearing the dunbar's number uh, from the experiment but there was no mathematics which can describe that uh, kilor's prediction but we are glad that we predicted and we found uh, with our mathematics we have shown it is uh, that it is possible to describe the properties of networks using invariance from chemical graph theory this indices have uh, the benefit that they will allow us to capture the dynamic properties of how the network grows and how information is likely to flow through a network so probably Dun- uh, professor dunbar discussed about the network flow so this is another idea Uh, and uh, i can tell you that uh, there is a very nice connection with topological indices and the polynomials uh, that is um, uh, polynomials as topological invar- invar- uh, invariance and uh, information flow so on uh, one of the benefits of an approach based on m polynomials is that uh, it provides a basis for comparing networks of such different size and structure so what we found that extroverts and introverts have networks of different size uh, with m corresponding different dynamic properties and m polynomials provide us with a metric uh, for uh, determining the consequence of these differences both uh, for the personality types concerned and also for their capacity to form integrated networks when their characteristics differ in the way they do so so you can understand from our work that we consider the one's social structure and as well as we indirectly added the personality in our networking so that's really interesting to know that so many um, uh, ideas are connecting in one dunbar's graph uh, m polynomials provide us with a natural metric for describing and comparing the structure and properties of social networks in a way that it reflects the growth properties 
so it also allow us to determine how optimal these networks are as well as uh, it provide a metric for comparing the efficiency of different network such analysis have implications for understanding the efficiency of uh, business organization and it is found that there are higher um, hierarchically structured networks of this kind so you can check that our uh, m comma n comma r graph is nothing but the most of the agent recruitment graph that we found in our uh, earlier days or maybe uh, in some cases you can find also till now so here we consider networks with uh, only a limited range of structures uh, the computed value suggests that the networks in which both m and n layers only target their inner core that is five layers are unlikely to reach wide enough range of alters to successfully meet milgram small world criteria it means that no matter how much you are ext uh, extrovert if you want to share some information or share some parcel or share anything uh, through the milgram so you have to rely on your inner core people that means the people who are in your inner layer which is nothing but the maximum five and it's really interesting uh, and often we know that we often we tell that we share the information but the information uh, was not uh, uh, sent to other so what's going on so we became depressed so all these things are because of our study uh, because we feel that everyone is reliable but it's not true in general it's the people those who are in the core level so uh, so long as well as the layers at least target their perspective 50 layers a chain six chain path is likely to reach a sufficiently large population to look at the target individual and uh, the four chain paths are likely to be challenged it simply means that uh, you can check from our uh, previous calculation that uh, it's it's really true from uh, the perspective of topological indices however both four and six chain paths are likely to reach uh, a wide enough of population to be sure of finding the target provided all layer, layers exploit uh, their full 150 social networks and it uh, this paper confirms the empirical findings of kilowatt et al who used uh, a small world experimental design to show that number of people selected as the first step in the chain reach peak somewhere in region uh, 150 to 250 and let's come to the future perspective of dunbar's graph uh, i'm not going to share all the future perspectives of dunbar's Dun Dun graphs but i am sharing only this one because uh, we are uh, working on some ideas with uh, this topic related to in our next paper so i'm just uh, giving you some uh, future perspective and there are very very interesting perspective of dunbar's graph in social network so this is the famous picture that we found in uh, a few days ago and it is the it was the picture of gathering of migrants at bandra railway station in mumbai after uh, rumors of special train was uh, 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 spared in the network and during the lockdown when government of India declared lockdown so that was the incident and government of India as well as the government of Mumbai and uh, police they had to face several struggle to uh, maintain the uh, that uh, crowd and uh, to make them uh, uh, make them faithful on the government rather than relying on uh, the fake news uh, that no there was no special train uh, on uh, on that particular day from the bandra railway station so so that is the future perspective of Dun dunbar's class why it is i'm coming to the next slide next to after two slides so this is the this is the report of uh, india tv so you can check that india tv uh, just uh, uh, collect the information as thousand Mumbai and thousands of migrants gathered at Bandra railway station after rumors of special train. Similarly, it is it was not the incident that happened in India during the lockdown. So I'm not familiar about uh, the other parts of the world, but I'm right, uh, starting from my own country. So three arrested in Telangana for spreading fake news of coronavirus. So this is reported by uh, NDTV. And here also you can check the Hindu, which reported a very interesting uh, news. 
coronavirus lockdown union home ministry blames fake news for migrant workers gathering at the bus stations okay and the last one is that government uh, doctors text whatsapp uh, video route to fight covid misinformation so now what is the what is my intention to show all these um, uh, snaps to all of you because uh, have you ever thought that when the misinformation misinformations are spread so are they spread from the hierarchy layer of 5 or 15 people that means if i got a, if i have the misinformation so will i share the misinformation randomly randomly to anyone who is in my whatsapp group or shall i share that misinformation to someone who is in my core level okay that is 5 or even 15 or 50 level or 150 so have you ever thought yes that is the important questions um, that is one of the important question regarding the dunbar's graph and their future perspective and i can tell you if uh, some day we will be able to give some possible answer with dunbar's number then i can assure you that there will be very less number of riots in the world and world will be more peaceful and it will be a more better place to live than we are now so uh, yeah then uh, at the last i am uh, just uh, coming to the conclusion part and exploration of how the polynomials change uh, as network size and structure increase allow us to examine how this indicates behave sorry indices behave this may allow us to determine which characteristics have most impact on invariance and so to consider whether it is possible to design networks for administrative structures that are more functional in terms of efficiency of information flow it this line simply means that imagine i am a uh, i am a cm of any state okay so if i am just uh, thinking to make some um, uh, project for my state so will i uh, give the responsibility to make the blueprint of the project to any of my staff in my uh, secretariat that is the interesting question or the i will just send them to pa and the pa will uh, discuss with a very close of his acquaintances that's interesting fact this might also have implications for the design of online networking software so we might for example ask whether the availability of cheap price service facilities provide the possibility of creating stronger social networks leading to greater social cohesion so shared sub tasks and this is my reference so you can check that uh, the first one is of uh, stanley milgram's uh, famous uh, world so small world phenomena and which changed the entire uh, study of social networking next one is thevers and milgram's which i discussed next one next one is the third one is the very very burning paper in which uh, professor dunbar shared his uh, dunbar's number and the last one is uh, that i discussed on dunbar's uh, graphs in social networking and which published in symmetry that is me uh, my co-author uh, bijit and uh, professor dunbar himself and uh, it's is it's freely available so uh, thank you uh, from my side now i am handing over it uh, to professor uh, tarik kumar datta sir for the next uh, uh, thing and i'm uh, waiting to take some questions from your side thank you uh thank you very much sir hello thank you okay and i think uh, it's okay santonu thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk and moreover the concept of topological index social brain hypothesis six degrees of small world phenomenon and all these are the very very interesting concept related to the social networking 
Anyway, we have received so many interesting questions from different participants. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Dutta, could you please read, read some questions? Dr. Sanjay Dutta, are you here, Dr. Sanjay Dutta? Then I read one question, Santanu. Yes, sir. This social pain hypothesis is it related to the social linkage of our animal, insect, or human brain? Sir, uh, basically, uh, if I cons uh, consider about the social brain hypothesis or social brain uh, phenomena, so it's uh, basically related to a uh, an animal's uh, cognitive uh, behavior to maintain the limit uh, social uh, connections. Okay, so uh, I I am not familiar about the fact whether uh, this in, uh, considers uh, that uh, how much I am uh, connected with an animal or how many animals uh, will be connected to me. But social human hypothesis says that we being the uh, uh, human. So we have some limitations, social limitations of uh, making friends and human cognitions. Similarly, the other animals, respective animals have the respective social cognitions. So uh, as far my knowledge is concerned, social brain hypothesis does not uh, uh, connect with uh, human and animal. It's between the uh, species. Is it fine? Okay, sir? thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. But anyway, time is a constraint for us and yes, we have received uh, so many requests from the participant and definitely we will try our best to compile with all the requests and we have received so many interesting questions and in course of time definitely we will try to give the appropriate answer to this question and we will communicate through their respective email. And yes, now we request uh, Dr. Hemen Farali, the head of the Department of Mathematics of Assam Don Bosco University, to present vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, it is audible. Thank you, sir. At the very outset, I, on behalf of the Department of Mathematics, Assam Don Bosco University, would like to extend our heartiest gratitude and regards to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Stephen Mabili, for initiating the avenir with very enlightened welcome address and also for his valuable support and advice for the success of the avenir. Next, I would like to express our deep thanks and gratitude to internationally appointed academician. Professor Robin I. M. Dunbar, Emeritus Professor of Evolutionary Psychology, Oxford University, UK, for his kind acceptance of our request to give a talk at the Avenir, and for his outstanding seminar talk. So his talk will definitely have very high impact on the interdisciplinary area of research in mathematical science. In our university academic community, research scholars and students will benefit much by his enlightened talk. We are also very much grateful to our another speaker, Dr. Santanu Asarji, for accepting our request and for delivering very interesting and exciting talk, which will be very, smart, very much beneficial to our young generation. Our happiness knows no bounds when we have had more than 3,000 plus participants from different countries all over the world. And this kind of webinar and interaction would definitely reflect our ideas and experience to each other. So this will create a strong harmony and unity among the academic community all over the globe. We express our deep thanks and gratitude to all the participants and hope to see you all again in our next academic programs. We are very much indebted to our all school directors, including Dr. Manmohiri Burwa, Director of School of Fundamental and Applied Sciences, and Srihi Burwa, Director of Human Resource, all faculty members, 
students and the faculty members of the Department of Mathematics for their full support, cooperation, and participation at the webinar. I appreciate Professor Tani Kumar Dutta, convener of this webinar, for taking initiative and for making the event great success. We are also extending our heartiest thanks and gratitude to Dr. Aziz Khan for his active role for managing the network and technical system very efficiently. So thanking to all. So with this, I conclude the vote of thanks. Thank sir, you. I have one question. Thank sir, you. sir, hello, sir. Hello, sir, uh, I have one question. OK, yes, please. Go ahead. Oh, am I audible to you? Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I am Siddhartha Chatterjee, Department of Computer Science Engineering, JS Group, Kolkata. So uh, right. my question is, uh, J when we uh, will get the feedback link? Uh, definitely, we uh, definitely feedback link has already been circulated. And if you do not receive, definitely we will send it to your email. You please fill up your feedback and definitely you will get uh, our certificate. Definitely oh, that means Th that means that after fill up of feed feedback link, it automatically generates the e certificate, right? Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. And you send my uh, you send the feedback link through my mail ID. Okay, Not definitely. Chat box. No, Not chat chat box, box also. I think feedback link is there. Chat box also feedback link is there. I do so, not know. Uh, why I cannot why find not find it. Me. Sir, I uh, cannot yeah. find it. So please post again. Please you have to. Listen here, you have to download the link. I mean, download the certificate from the link. Okay, okay, now, 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 feedback link. Dr. Ajit Khan. Okay, okay, thank yes. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, 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 right, right. Okay, at the end, uh, I also thankful and grateful to our two speakers, Professor Dunbar and Dr. Santonu. And I am also very much grateful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Honorable Register. Honorable all the directors, particularly Dr. Monmori Borua and the Human Resource Director, Zuhi Madam, and all the faculty members of Mathematics Department, students of Mathematics Department, other faculty members for helping me in a great way. I am really very much grateful and indebted to Dr. Aziz Khan for his outstanding help in all respects, starting from the very beginning up to the end. Thank you very much all and hoping to see you all in our next academic program. And with a lot of thanks to all, we come to the end of this webinar. Thanks all. Thank you.